All right, we're going to get started. My name is Chris Thema, and we're going to talk today about e-commerce decision making and uh, how customers decide what to buy. So you should see my screen, my presentation right in front of you. That is what we're talking about today. And I want to start by asking you if you've ever seen one of these, right? Look closely, pay attention, take a look. Have you ever seen one, right? It is a plastic snake, and uh, you likely have someone in your life who thought at some point in your life that it was funny if they just threw this snake out in front of your path. Maybe you turn the corner around uh, a hallway or out of a room and into a hallway, and boom, there it is, and you jump. You freak out. You go, ah, there is a snake on the ground, and it takes you a second to realize that maybe it's a plastic snake. Right now, here's the thing we know from the time you see the snake to then recognizing it is a snake to then determining the danger coefficient here of specific snake and then sending from that point in your brain all of the alarms that go, hey, you uh, you better jump right back up like this is a big deal. There's a danger, right? It takes anywhere from 100 to 500 milliseconds. Here's the crazy thing right? Most of us jump in less than 5% of that time, right? I mean, if you if you were to stop, you know, if you had the, the most efficient stopwatch in the world, right, that could, that could measure time at the tiniest femtosecond, and you could clock exactly how long it took for that, that image of a snake on the ground in front of you to reach and run the optical nerve all the way back to the brain to process and determine there's something wrong here to send a note to your legs that says, stop moving, back up, whatever. All of that time would be way more, right? 20 times more than what it takes for most of us to respond, right? And you go, how's that possible? Well, there's a little something in our brain called the amygdala, right? And what it does is it takes like these mini snapshots of situations to help our safety, right? It keeps us safe by assigning both emotion and memory together to create kind of that, that um, the notion of something that's scary. If you lived in New York City and you happened to be in Manhattan, 9-11, and that morning before any planes crashed into buildings, you just heard the planes overhead. And then there was, crashes and destruction and fires and death you might the following week or the following month find yourself in st louis walking outside and the plane that would fly over you to get ready to land in st louis would cause your entire body to start reacting we know this because they've done the studies right they evaluated all the people who were there and uh or not all the people but many people who were there and who uh, we're showing signs of PTSD in other cities, in other places, at other times, right? And you go, but I'm in St. Louis now, and that's just a normal plane, and there's no tall buildings. But your body, right, and particularly your amygdala is like, hey, danger, Will Robinson, that's a plane, and the last time you heard planes, there was destruction. Pay attention, get ready, right? Um, our brain is incredible, and it does amazing things for us. And sometimes those things are amazing, awesome, incredible. Other times, doesn't serve us very well. For example, right, if a plane's flying in uh, in the middle of Ohio and there's no tall buildings anywhere, your worry about a plane hitting a tall building is nonsensical, right? It's just, it's not even a possibility. And yet, that's what would happen, right, if you were in some other trauma. Um, our brains learn quickly, and they develop those patterns quickly to protect us. And sometimes that's awesome. And like I said, sometimes it's not so great. Now, we used to think that dopamine was the neurotransmitter for pleasure, right? That it would trigger. And, and there were tons of articles long before uh, some of the, so the studies I'm going to talk to you about. Um, but this, this idea, right, was that um, we, would, we would run these little tests and dope, the dopamine center um, or the, the part of your brain where dopamine runs through, right, would would trigger when there was good news, right? A, a rat finds cheese and you're like, yay. Um, but it turns out dopamine 
isn't about pleasure. It's about the anticipation of pleasure. And to help you understand that, right, we have to talk about rats. We have to talk about particular scientist Robert Spolsky um, because he set up an experiment that highlighted that the dopamine release was tied to anticipation, not to the reward or pleasure, right? So if you take a look at this chart, you're gonna see there was a signal. The signal in this case was a light bulb, right? Rats were in there and this light bulb would, would light up and the rat knew, hey, when the light bulb lights up, I gotta run this path and get to a little lever and I need to push the lever. And if I push the lever 10 times, out comes some food, right? And it was a guarantee, it was 100%. And 100% of the time, you see the bulb, you run over to the lever, you hit it 10 times, out comes food. Rats, they were able to measure and see the dopamine release. And the dopamine release, by the way, happened before they did the work, right? The moment they saw the light, they were like, oh, I know it's coming, food. All I have to do is cause and affect this thing. I know that if I go push this lever, I'm gonna get food. This is gonna be awesome. So what they do? It went over. Press the lever 10 times, out comes the reward. By this point, the dopamine drops off. Notice we're not seeing dopamine kick off when they're eating the cheese. It's not, it's not the pleasure sense, pleasure sensor. It is tied to the anticipation of that pleasure. So they said, well, let's let's do something else, right? Let's set it up so that when the light goes on and they go do the 10 pushes of the lever, let's go see if we only give them food half the time, right? 50%. Now, now you can see this curve, right? The dopamine release is massive, right? Because now it's like, I wonder if, right? Like may, maybe I get it, maybe I don't, but oh, I hope I do. In fact, today I'm feeling pretty lucky. Let's go do this. And so they go and do the work and then half the time they get the food, half the time they don't. When they continued the study and made it either 25% of the time that food came out or 75%, the dopamine was higher than 100%, but, but less, right? The, the, the trick here was if half the time, half the time they were able to deliver or not deliver food, the anticipation, right? And the, and the, the dopamine kickoff that went off with that, the anticipation was at its highest levels, right? So the question is, are you leveraging this dynamic? right? Between purchase and product delivery, are you doing anything related to anticipation? Most of us don't, right? Zappos, if you buy a pair of shoes from Zappos and you don't do anything special with uh, shipping or anything else, sometimes, some amount of times, Zappos will upgrade your shipping and instead of it being, you know, like three to five days, it's suddenly next day. But it's not consistent. It's not regular. It's just every now and then we decide to uh, to upgrade it. And they send you an email that says, hey, guess what? We think you're awesome. We think these shoes are awesome. So we've put them on our fastest track and you should get them tomorrow. And you get excited, right? You go, oh my God, this is awesome, right? And it also makes you think, maybe I should buy from Zappos instead of any other shoe store again. So why are we talking about the brain, right? Because when we're talking about decisions, you can't really talk about decisions, decision-making without understanding what goes on in someone's brain, all right? You've probably said something like, hey, you know what? People buy products after evaluating the options and the value that each delivers. Or you've said something like, you know what, people are, you know, people go through a rational evaluation to drive their greatest self-interest, right? And the value that delivers is self-interest. Or maybe you don't talk that way. And you maybe when you talk about yourself, you just say something like, um, well, I evaluate all the options and I pick the best one, right? But that's not how it works. It turns out that even though we like to tell ourselves that we analyzed all the options, we evaluated all the criteria and data, and then we made our choice, that's not how it works. That's not how our brains work. Um, our brains aren't computers and our selection process isn't uh, a spreadsheet exercise, right? So what we wanna do today is talk a little about 
how it actually works. All right. Now, if you're going, okay, this is great, but uh, wh where can I get more of this information when this is all done? Right. I said I wasn't selling you anything. I want to be clear. I'm not selling you anything. But if you were interested in buying some books, these three books are fantastic. You will like them. Uh, Martin Lindstrom, uh, the the two guys that did neuromarketing, and of course Daniel Kahneman, who may be the fam most famous one of this list of books, are great books on decision making and mostly on the dynamics that are running behind the scenes that sometimes uh, aren't what we think they are. Right? It's not as rational as we thought we might be. Right? So I want you to think about uh, decision making differently than you have before, right? I want you to think about it as we have a felt need. <clears throat> I need something. And from that, I move into, uh, I wanna make sure that I trust someone. And from that, I make a decision. If I trust it, I make a decision. After I make the decision, I start justifying the decision. And then I cement that justification by sharing it. And you're going to go, wait, 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 that's not how I work. Um, I disagree with you, right? That is how you work. That's the way all of us work. And what tends to happen is we go, oh, I, I feel this need. But you know where that need comes from? Someone's sharing, right? And it's a cycle. So someone puts a picture of the newest barbecue or the newest fire pit or the newest uh, car or the newest sweater or the newest dress or the newest iPhone gadget or whatever, they share it and we look at it and we go, oh my God, I need that, right? We feel need. Why? Because someone shared us a photo and the photos work and we went, ooh, uh, I need that. And then we went to the place where they were selling it. And either we trusted this place or there was a lot of little red flags that went, mm, doesn't feel safe. And we bounced out. But if we felt safe, we bought it. And then the moment we bought it, we start going through the process of trying to explain uh, to ourselves and ultimately to others why we did it. And then what do we do? We share it so that other people can carry on and do it. Because by the way, if everybody else is buying it, it feels a lot better when we buy it, right? And it feels better, like it doesn't feel so bad that we bought it because other people are buying it too. So you can just you can tell everybody, hey, other people are buying it too, all right? So this is the practical way of thinking about e-commerce decision-making. And it doesn't look like the way we normally think about it, right? We try and set up product pages and everything else to be like, what's all the data they're going to assess to evaluate? We all work rationally instead of understanding that most of our customers work irrationally and we could tailor how we do what we do differently to deliver better decision-making, right? Or to deliver better conversion, right? Which is the goal of, of e-commerce, right? So this was... This was the same written version of what I just showed you, right? Which is the, hey, feel the need, feel the trust, make a decision, justify the decision and share. <clears throat> and uh, the important part, <clears throat> the important part is to understand that it is a cycle. The moment we share, we, we do the very same thing that someone else did uh, to get us to feel need, right? And so it's a loop, it just keeps going on and on. So let's dig into it and talk about how this affects how you design or build out your e-commerce stores. First, we're talking about someone feels a need, right? And it turns out, right, that our feelings around need are driven by the stories we hear and the images we see, right? So what does that mean for you? If you want other people to feel that need, you're going to need to use a lot of photos. Photos, 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 right? And big ones, large ones, uh, close-ups, right? People want to look at, if you're looking at a leather bag, it's not just, let me look at the leather bag from afar. It's three kinds of photos, right? Number one, I need to see a photo in use. That helps me understand sizing. It helps me visualize myself holding that bag or anything else. Um, we also need, uh, what it looks like from every dimension, right? So turn it around or whatever so that I can see and answer my own questions, right? Like, does that have a shoulder strap or not, right? And if I can look at it, I go, oh, and actually that looks pretty long. Okay, that's good because I'm a tall person or it doesn't look too long and I'm a short person, whatever. And then close-ups, right? I want to see the zipper. I want to see the stitching. I want to know that this is quality made and that it looks good, 
right? And I want to hear the stories, right? This is about testimonials, uh, quotes, reviews, right? I don't know if you're like me, but when I go look at a product on Amazon, I read the reviews, but I'm not reading the positive reviews, right? I mean, I may read one or two of the positive ones, but mostly I'm reading the negative ones because I want to know, does this negative review mean so much? I mean, does it make the case so well that I go, all right, I don't want this product, right? I was buying a pair of speakers for our patio the other day, and I'm looking over this stuff and I'm reading, and one of them says, oh, if you play this kind of music at this level, right, these things are likely to um, distort the sound. And that's all I needed to know to be like, nope, next set, right? I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna skip past it. A lot of times we look and see what are the stories that either protect us, right? Tell us this isn't worth it, or the stories that you go, I didn't even know it could do that. Oh, now I totally need it, right? So testimonials slash reviews and photos. This, and, and of course you can use video too, right? But these are the things that help people feel that initial impetus of need. It's not all the, it's not all the details. Um, as long as you're in some realm, it's not about the price yet. This is, it's, it's not about shipping, but that'll come, right? But this is really about when someone sees it, can they get up close enough? Can they connect to it enough emotionally, viscerally and say, okay, yeah, actually I need that. And then it gets into trust. If your website looks like it was designed in 1992 or 95 or 98 or 2002, people are gonna bounce very quickly. They're just gonna go, nope, sorry, um, not interested. If your website has text that is like 10 point font and it's you know, top to bottom filled with it, we go, oh, no, 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 too much work, can't read it, we, we bounce, right? If it doesn't have a contemporary palette, uh, you know, you you remember there was a point in time when people built websites that were black background and bright yellow font, right? Um, you wouldn't buy from that site today, right? There was a point in time where people designed websites that had things that spun or mouse trails that moved all over. You wouldn't buy from that site today, right? Our sense of trust is really nuanced right? But it turns out it's driven dramatically by aesthetics, right? There is a link on the bottom of this slide at Science Direct, right? It's an article that highlights how people made purchasing choices based on site design, right? And they they do, like it's real. I'm, I'm not messing with you, right? People look at a site and the design of the site, and if it doesn't feel current, if it feels one or two generations back, there's an implicit risk analysis someone's doing, an implicit fear of whether or not you're really in business and whether you're going to take my money and run, and they don't make choices, right? And, and you, you don't want that, right? Because, again, we go from feeling a need to feeling trust. The very next step is making a decision. This is the only thing between feeling that need and making a decision is whether or not they feel like they can trust your site. And so the things you wanna do, right, is keep your design current, make sure that it looks professional, again, to those testimonials and other ways to show social proof that make people feel like, yeah, okay, this is legit. And then it comes to making a decision, right? And uh, he, here's the crazy part, right? We know, we know about cart abandonment, right? You've probably heard by now, 70% of carts get abandoned, it's horrible. One of the first dynamics, the main thing that people say when they when they decide to abandon a cart, the main driver is there wasn't free shipping. So you know that uh, how, how they pay and, and what is the line items of getting paid is gonna be an issue. Um, people often don't check the payment uh, approaches or the options until they get to checkout. So, you're gonna be like, okay, uh, I need to make sure that I'm articulating if you know if there's a payment plan or if there's something, how do I make that present and available to people early? Um, they use reviews all the time. We talked about testimonials before, right? Um, but you wanna make sure that reviews and comparisons are super easy to use. Um, you wanna create multiple ways to pay. I know, I, I have told you, right? I don't, I don't love uh, PayPal. I have mentioned it before. But I'll tell you this, 
people who used to have PayPal and Stripe and took off PayPal lost upwards of 30% of their transactions, right? Because people don't think of PayPal as money. They think about it as free money, right? It's just, that was the money that was in my account. Like I went to dinner a couple of weeks ago and then a friend PayPal'd me money, right? Now, again, that's a generational thing because today younger folks would be like Venmoing money. But either way, if you have money sitting somewhere, right, like PayPal, and you pay out of that, it doesn't even hit your bank account. It doesn't feel like real money, right? So having multiple ways to pay is powerful. Having the opportunity for people to filter on the reviewer attributes, not just uh, not just the, the reviews themselves, but like, hey, if this if this review is written, let's say you're looking at tennis shoes and you're Try, and you're you're a you know a hobbyist when it comes to exercise, and you see a review that says these shoes fell apart in three months, but you see that they're a professional runner and they run ten miles a day, you're gonna go that review doesn't count as much to me. In order to do that, you need to know about the reviewer, not just the review. Thankfully, Liquweb is rolling out a brand new plugin very quickly here, very shortly, uh, on how to add metadata to your reviews, right, of the reviewers. So that's exciting and it's free. Um, Reviews are important. Comparisons are important, right? The ability to look at two or three things to figure out which is the one that I want, right? If you're selling two, three, four, ten like items, and the and the price variation, right, is is in some realm where you go, I just don't know which one to buy. Often you want to be able to let people compare two or three and go, okay, which oh, they all have all the same features except this. Now I'm asking, is the price difference worth this one feature difference. So barn2.co.uk, they have a WooCommerce product table plugin that is incredible for this, for comparisons, right? But these are the things you wanna do to help people make a decision. Great reviews, making comparison easy, and creating multiple ways for people to pay. That's the trick to getting people to, boom, click the buy button, right? Click the checkout button, get them to the end. All right. Here is that review photo that I was talking to you about, right? When we built this feature, we built it on uh, Under Armour, right? We built it based on uh, what we were seeing at Under Armour. Almost nobody else does this well, right? But Under Armour, you can see, hey, uh, this is a shoe review, and here it is, right? Posted by this person. He's avid trainer and 6'1". This person is an avid trainer and also 6'1", right? So these are people that you go, oh, hey, um, I, if I am an avid trainer, right, uh, this review is going to matter a lot to me and I can filter, whoops, I can filter based on this, right? I can filter right up here and say, I, I only want to look at male reviewers or female reviewers or avid or professional athletes, only people that do basketball, right? If I'm buying basketball shoes, um, or people of a certain height. Now, in order for us to give this to you in, in WooCommerce, right, we would need to let each store owner define that, which is what we did, right? We let you define product attributes, right? Like size, comfort, and performance. And we let you define reviewer characteristics, right? So that customers can, or reviewers can pick on their own whether to share that information. They don't have to, but they can. It's very powerful and it's going in the repo today or tomorrow, right? Um, it'll be a free plugin that you can add to your WooCommerce stores. Um, it will also be included for free on all of our uh, manage WooCommerce hosting customers, right? Um, so this becomes very, very powerful when you can see and filter the reviews to people like you, right? That makes a huge difference in the world. All right. Now, what happens after that? Ultimately, people have to justify their decision, right? I want you to think about it. Every time someone's making a buying purchase on your site, I want you to think about it as if they had to explain it to a spouse or boss, right? Um, I want I want them to feel right. I want them to feel good about what they the decision they just made. And the best way I can do that, right, is case studies. So here's what normally happens when I go to a store. I go buy something. I get three emails. I get an email that says. Thank you for being a customer. I'm the CEO, and I just want to let you know that I care about you. I don't believe it because it's on autopilot, but still, that's fine. I get a second email that is like, hey, uh, here's your receipt. It shows you the stuff. And I make it a third if it's a physical product that tells me 
uh, here's where, you know, here's when you can expect to, to have it delivered. If it's a digital product, it might be my onboarding. Here's where to go click uh, the link and here's your login and password um, to get access. All three of those are transactionally oriented emails and none of them help me justify my decision, right? You have an opportunity with your onboarding emails, right? To not just send receipts, to send the justification of the decision. Imagine that I just bought, I don't know, something something somewhat expensive, right? Imagine that I just bought uh, a television, but one of those nicer televisions, right? A fancy television. I don't know what the technology is, but there's one after the LED, right? The LG has a new um, OLED, right? And I spent, let's say I spend good money on that TV. Imagine if I get an email the next day or the day after, and it says, congratulations on buying this. Let's imagine that Best Buy sends it to me. And Best Buy says, we think you're gonna love this TV. This TV is incredible, you're gonna get great, this and that, right? They start you know, going over all the features of what I just bought. Um, here's the thing, right? Some customers are putting this TV in their office, in their home office. And if that's the case, we want to tell you how you can use this TV for video conferencing and other displays of what's on your regular computer screens. With this one cable, right, that goes from your computer to the HDMI port in the TV, this is what's possible. So I'm going to tell you what people have done, how they've used it, et cetera. And by the way, I can even say, here's, here's a $12 cable that can make all this happen. If I spent $2,000 or $3,000, however much this TV costs, on that, would I have any problem paying $12? No. But imagine what happens when I have to go out to the, you know, outside my home office and tell my wife, hey, by the way, I bought this, this new TV. What, what's the next thing I'm going to say? But you know what? It's amazing, right? You know how often I'm on video calls in my office. It's amazing for video conferencing. It's fantastic for displaying. When You, you remember that last time when Karen or Susie was in my office and we were showing them some of the pr project stuff for them? Remember? We could have, instead of having them all stand behind me and look at my monitors, we can now present it on the on the TV screen, right? The big screen TV and stuff. I'm going to justify my decision, which is going to cement the reason I wanted this. It's going to lower my notion of of returning it. It's going to lower my notion of uh, wanting that that money back, or it's going to encourage me to share it with others just to cement, hey, go on Twitter. I don't know if you know this, but the latest LG is also great for blah, 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 right? I'm cementing my commitment to it, but I'm also now spinning the cycle up for other people, right? Which is what we'll get to in the next step, which is the sharing, right? You have an incredible opportunity with your onboarding emails to do more than just send a receipt, right? We, we do this at Liquid Web for our managed WooCommerce customers. We do this with a product called Jilt. You can do it with Jilt wherever you're hosted, you can do it with other other solutions, right? It, like you you don't have to. Uh, I worked with a customer the other day who was not with us, but they had WP Fusion and they had it integrated so that they could put every purchaser into their CRM, which was ConvertKit. And then once they did, they could use ConvertKit and an automation to send it out. You can do that with Active Campaign. You can do it with Mailchimp. So lots of different solutions out there. The point is, don't just send the receipt. Don't just send the welcome email, right? help people embrace the the product that they just chose right was the right product right i even saw one customer who took this to an extreme they were building a membership site right uh e-commerce solution but it was membership people would come in and they'd get months and months of content dripped out to them over the course of a year and in the thank you right the app right after you know someone bought their the rights to their program right which i think was something like 99 dollars a month their next follow-up email a day later was hey we hope you've logged in we hope you've seen this but here's what we know this leadership material is so important that it is worth you talking about it with someone else so here's a link that you can share with one person and it will give them access to the same membership solution you just bought for free now, now think about that right what they're really doing is they're saying, hey, I'm gonna give away a free account for every account I sell, right? That, I mean, they're literally saying, 
this isn't worth $99 internally, right? It's worth 45 because I'm going to give one away for free. So each one, you know, you split it up. But, but that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is saying, we know that the average person who buys something like an online membership quits after four months. We also know that if they have a friend in the group and they're able to talk about it, they last longer. So we are going to leverage more long-term revenue if we can get you and a friend to be in and involve yourselves in this stuff. How are we gonna make sure that you justify your decision? We're gonna get you to invite one of your friends and your friend and you will agree that, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm so glad we're in this, right? And it will keep you in longer. Your onboarding emails, your first emails after, as long as they're not receipts, there's a lot of ways you can get creative to ensure that people feel like this was a good call, right? Because you don't want the chargeback. You don't want, you know, there, there are people, right, who will buy your digital ebook, read it because it takes less than two hours, and then turn around and ask for a refund, right? And they exist. And, and we've seen people sign up for a membership site, go in, download all the things, and then bounce out a day later and ask for a refund, right? Um, it's crazy, but it's because we haven't helped them justify that this was a good way to spend their time and money, right? And so your follow-up emails are critical to making sure someone says, "This was I made a good I made a good decision here." Hopefully that makes sense. Lastly, right, the last part of the cycle is the share cycle, right? If you're not making it easy for people to share their purchases. If you're not making it like, um, well, I'll just tell you, right? 70% of millennials are influenced by the recommendations of their peers, right? And 30% are more likely to buy a product recommended by a non-celebrity blogger, right? Not someone famous, but an ordinary person. So you have to make it easy for them to share that purchase on social, like Facebook. or like I mentioned earlier, give them coupons to share with their friends, right? Hey, it'd be great, you know, it'd be better if you could get your friends to join you here. So let's let's share the love, right? Fundamentally, there are people who look left, look right. They look at what people are buying. If you can create that ability, right, to help them share the other people who are looking left and right, like what am I, what does this friend do and what does this friend do? I, when I first started uh, doing some, some coaching in the WordPress ecosystem years ago, uh, when the call ended, they would say, well, how much do I owe you? And I said, uh, don't, uh, don't worry about it, right? It's free. And they went, what? I said, it was just, you know, it was a half hour, it was 40 minutes. Don't worry about it. But if you like, what you could do is you could go to Twitter and you could just say, hey, I had a great business call with Chris Lemon, right? All I care about is the business call. Uh, it's not a technical call. It's a business call. And just, just. Tweet out to your friends. So several months, three months into this, uh, I got a, a note from someone that said, hey, can I, can I do a call with you? And I said, sure. And so we got on the call, right? In those days, it was Skype. And uh, I said, how can I help you? And the person says, I don't know. And I was like, I, I don't understand how, how, like, you wanted to talk to me, and you don't know what we're going to talk about? He said, Honestly, I've had three friends in the last couple of weeks all announce on Twitter that they've had great business calls with you, and I feel like I'm just missing something. So, what what do you do in these calls that, that I could benefit from? Because I I you know I don't want to be left out. That is the exact dynamic we're talking about, right? People look at what other people are getting, what they're buying, what they're doing, and they go, I don't want to be left out. So make it easy, make it easy for people to say, I had a great purchase experience or I bought this amazing thing or check out the new t-shirt I'll be wearing next week, right? Whatever it is, create easy ways for people to share post-purchase. Now that may be right on the post-purchase thank you screen. It may be in a follow-up email, but however you do it, you may, you may literally do it with an exchange like, hey, let your friends know. And by publishing it on Twitter, right, we'll give you a 10% coupon on your next item of this value, right? It doesn't matter how you do it. The goal is to get people to share because you recall sharing starts the cycle all the way over again, right? And that gets more people feeling like they have needs, felt needs that they want to deal with, all right? So what we've talked about, right, over the last 
roughly 40 minutes, right, has been all the things that motivate people's brains. Photos, videos, reviews, testimonials, stories with emotion. And the last one that I haven't talked about yet, but I'll end with today, is the value of contrast. It's what happens when we talk about case studies. It's, it's uh, implicit there, but you can use it in ads. You can use it on the product pages and everywhere else. It's the notion of before and after. It's the notion of something dramatic and different because we pay attention to contrast. You can't help but pay attention to contrast. That's the way your brain works. Your brain is constantly evaluating over everything that you can imagine. It's constantly evaluating contrast. For example, right now, imagine that as I'm talking, you're also looking at other screens, you're doing other things on your computer, stuff like that, right? And then imagine if I got really quiet. I have a secret to share with you. Your brain looks up. Your brain focuses back. Your brain goes, wait, what was that silence right there? Because your brain noticed the contrast. Talk, 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 silence. And it looked up. It looked around. You likely just experienced this. That's just the nature of how your brain works. It pays attention to contrast. And so when you're creating your e-commerce site, your product pages, your follow-up onboarding emails, right? you want to leverage contrast. You want to make sure that you're getting people to pay attention. That's what motivates their brain. You do that and all the rest of this, right? Photos, you can even use photos in before and after. I have a plumber friend who does that, right? Every time he does a job, he takes the before, he takes the after. And people keep seeing that difference and going, I, I want a new bathroom, I want a new kitchen, I want a new whatever, and like, great, I can help with that, right? Before and after contrast with photos in the testimonials, in your case studies, right? Stories with emotion there. Um, these are all the things will cause people to say, I have a felt need. And you know if you get them to feel that need, as long as your site doesn't destroy trust, you can get them to make a decision. That's it. Like I said, my name is Chris Summer. You can find me on Twitter at, at Chris Summer. I blog over at chrissummer.com and a couple other sites, but I also blog over at Liquid Web. And Liquid Web is where I'm the VP of products and innovation over there. And this is who has brought you uh, this webinar is Liquid Web. We do have managed WordPress and managed WooCommerce offerings. Um, and what we're gonna do now for the next few minutes is if you have uh, questions, you're gonna go to your question tab and uh, put in uh, any questions you want there and we'll take a look and answer them. If you don't have any questions today, that's fine too. Not a problem at all. Um, one of the questions we get all the time is, was this recorded and will people be able to get it, especially if they had to bounce out early? And the answer is, uh, of course, it has been recorded and you will likely get it tomorrow before the close of business, our time. So with that, I will open it up to questions. If any of you have them, feel free to go to the uh, questions section of this go to webinar control panel and uh, and you can type them in there. I should be able to see them and uh, I will be happy to answer them. All right, I am not seeing a lot of questions. So I am just going to wrap us up and just say thank you so much for coming out and being part of this webinar. Uh, again, all of our webinars are available uh, online in our, in our, um, on our site. And so um, we'll be sure to send you information so that you can not only see this one, but everything else we've done. I hope you have a great rest of your day. If you're in India like Vishal was, uh, I hope you go to bed now, right? Because it is late over there. And I will talk to you guys later.